Okay, so how do you be a successful investor? Now, I'm assuming that you're not going to go into the business of investing. I'm assuming that you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. You're going to pursue your passion. But you're going to have some money that you're going to save over time. And I'm going to give you my advice on the topic. It's not necessarily definitive advice, but it's what the advice I would give my sister, my grandmother, on what she should do if she were in the same position. I think that's probably the right way to think about it. So number one, how do you avoid losing money? What are good places to invest? Well, my first piece of advice is, despite the story about the lemonade stand, I'd avoid investing in lemonade stands. I'd avoid investing in startup businesses um, where the prospects are not very well known. Because again, you don't need to make 100% a year to have a fortune. You just need to invest at an attractive return, 10, 15% over a long period of time, your money grows very significantly. So how do you avoid the riskiest investments? I would, my advice would be to invest in public securities, invest in listed companies, companies that trade on the stock market. Why? Because those businesses are, tend to be more established. They have to meet certain hurdles before they go public. The stocks are liquid, so you can change your mind if you want to sell. If you invest in a private lemonade stand, it's hard to find someone to take you out of that investment uh, unless that business becomes fabulously profitable. So that's piece of advice number one. Invest in public companies. Number two, you want to invest in businesses that you can understand. What I mean by that is there are lots of businesses that you come in, that you deal with in the course of your day and your personal life, whether it's a retail store that you know because you like shopping there or it's a, a product, uh, your, your, your iPad or that you know uh, that you think is a great product. But you, you, under, you have to understand how the company makes money. If the business is just too complicated. You don't understand how they make money. Even if they've had a great track record, I would avoid it. And a lot of people thought Enron was an incredible business because it appeared to have a good track record, but very few people understood how they made money. It was good to avoid it. Another very important criteria is you want to invest at a reasonable price. It could be a fabulous business that's done very well over a long period of time, but if you pay too much for it, you're not going to earn a very good return. The last bit is that you want to invest in a business that you could theoretically own forever. If the stock market were to close for 10 years, you wouldn't be unhappy. What do I mean by that? Now, again, if you're going to compound your money at at a 10 or 15% return over a 43-year period of time, you really want a business that you can own forever. You don't want to constantly have to be shifting from one business to the next. And what are, what are businesses that you can own forever? Well, there are very few that sort of meet that standard. Uh, maybe a good example is Coca-Cola, right? What's good about Coca-Cola is it's a relatively easy business to understand. You understand how Coke makes money, right? They sell a, a formula uh, or syrup uh, to bottlers and to retail establishments, and they make a profit every time they serve a Coca-Cola. People are going to drink a lot of Coca-Cola for a very long period of time. The world's population is growing. They sell in almost every country in the world. And each year, people drink a little bit more Coca-Cola. So it's a pretty easy business to understand. And it's also a business that I think is unlikely to be uh, competed away uh, as a result of technology or some other new product. Right? It's been around long enough. People have grown used to the taste. Uh, you know, they, they, uh, parents give it to their children, and you can expect that it'll be around a long period of time. I think that's one good example. Another good example might be McDonald's. You may not love McDonald's hamburgers, but it's a business that's been around for 50 years. You understand how they make money. They open up these little, build these little boxes. They rent them to the franchisees. They charge them royalties in exchange for the name, and they sell hamburgers and french fries. And you know what? People have to eat. It's relatively low-cost food. The quality is pretty good, and they continue to grow every year. So I think the Consistent message here is try to find a business that you can understand, uh, that's not particularly complicated, that has a successful long-term track record, that makes a, a, an attractive profit, uh, and can grow over time. So what are the key things to look for in a business, as I say, that lasts forever? We want a bi business that sells a product or a service that people need and that is somewhat unique and uh, they, they have a, a loyalty to this particular brand or, or, or product, and that people are willing to pay a premium for that. I mean, a good, another good example might be a candy business. While people are willing to buy generic versions of many kind of food products, you know, flour, or sugar, they don't need to have the branded product. When it comes to candy, people don't tend to like the Walmart version or the Kmart version. They want the, you know, the Hershey chocolate bar or the Cadbury chocolate bar or the C's candy. They want the, the brand. And they're willing to pay a premium for that. And um, so that's, a, I think, a key thing. You want the product to be unique. You, you don't want it to be a commodity that everyone else can sell. Because when you sell a commodity, anyone can sell it. And they can sell it at a, at a better price. And it's very hard to make a profit doing that. If you're investing for the long term, you want to invest in businesses that have very little debt. We, in our little example before, we talked about our lemonade stand. 
you know, there's $250 worth of debt. That didn't put too much pressure on the lemonade stand company. But if it had been $1,000, we hit a rough patch. The business could have got out of business for failure to pay its debts. The shareholders could have been wiped out. So if you can find a company that can earn attractive profits, that doesn't have a lot of debt, where they generate vastly more profits than they need to pay the interest on their debt, that's a safe place to put your money over a long period of time. You want businesses that have what people call barriers to entry. You want a business where it's hard for someone tomorrow to set up a new company to compete with you and, and put you out of business. I mean, like going back to the Coca-Cola example, Coca-Cola has such a strong market presence. You know, people have come to expect when they go to a restaurant, they can ask for a Coke and get a Coke. It's very hard for someone else to break in. Now, of course, there's Pepsi and there are other soda brands, but Pepsi's been around a long time. Coca-Cola and Pepsi have continued to uh, exist side by side over long periods of time. So when you're thinking about choosing a company, make sure that they sell a product or a service that's it's hard for someone else to make a better one that you'll switch to tomorrow. You also want businesses that are not particularly sensitive to outside factors, so-called extrinsic factors that you can't control. So if a business uh, will be affected dramatically if the price of a particular commodity goes up, or if interest rates move up and down, or if uh, currency prices change, you, you want a company that's fairly immune to what's going on in the world. And I'll, I'll use my Coca-Cola example. I mean, if you think about Coca-Cola, it's a product that's been around probably 120 years. Over that period of time, there have been multiple world wars, the development of nuclear weapons, all kinds of unfortunate events and tragedies and so on and so forth. But each year, the company pretty much makes a little bit more money than they made before, and, they, and they're going to be around. And you can be confident, based on the history, that this is a business that's going to be around, almost regardless of whether interest rates are at 14%, whether the US dollar is uh, you know, not worth very much, or the price of gold's up or down. Those are the kind of companies you want to invest in the long term, businesses that are extremely uh, immune to the events that are going on in the world. Another criteria, if you think back to our lemonade stand company, as we grew, we had to buy more and more lemonade stands. Now, those lemonade stands only cost $300 each. But imagine a business where every time you grew, you had to build a new factory to produce more and more product. And those factories were really expensive. Well, that company might generate a lot of cash from the business, but in order to grow, you're going to have to just reinvest more and more cash into the business. The best businesses are the ones where it doesn't, they don't require a lot of capital to be reinvested in the company. They generate lots of cash that you can use to pay dividends to your shareholders, or you can invest in new high return attractive projects. I guess the last point I would make is that you invest in public companies. It's probably safest to invest in businesses that are not controlled. A controlled company is kind of like our lemonade sand business that we took public. The problem with a controlled company, unless the controlling shareholder is someone you completely trust, unless there's someone that has a, a, a great track record for taking care of so-called minority investors, the non-controlling shareholders, it can be a risk of proposition to invest in that business because you're at the whim of the controlling shareholder. And even if the controlling shareholder today is someone that you feel comfortable with, there's no assurance that in the future they might sell control to someone else who's not going to be as uh, supportive of the shareholders of the business. So it's not that you just you can simply have a profitable business and a business that uh, has, has done well, you have to make sure that the management and the people that control the business think about you as an owner and are going to protect your interests. So these are some of the key criteria to think about. Now, when are you ready to start investing money? My guess is you're a student, you probably have student loans, perhaps you even have some credit card debt, you're going to graduate, you're going to get a job. So you don't want to jump right in and uh, while you have a lot of debt outstanding, start investing in the stock market. The stock market is a place to invest when you've got a good, you have money you can put away and you won't need for five years or maybe 10 years. So if you're paying relatively high interest rates on your credit cards, you definitely want to pay off your credit cards first before you think about investing in the stock market. Your student loans are probably lower cost than your credit cards, but again, here, my best advice would be, you know, once you, if your student loans are costing you six or 7%, well, if you pay them off, it's as if you earned a guaranteed six or 7% return. Uh, and you're just better off getting rid of your credit card debt and even your student loan debt before you commit a lot of a material amount of money to the, uh, to the stock market. You, even once you, you paid off your credit card debt, you, perhaps you paid down your student loans, you want to have enough money in the bank so that even if you were to lose your, lose your job tomorrow, you've got a good six months, maybe even 12 months of money set aside.